what was it only 50 years ago that women couldn't open a bank account if they weren't married wild isn't that crazy it's wild what does that tell us as women you are not worthy if you are without a man really the more we come into that too and really support like the range and the spectrum of womanhood it's just such a beautiful place to get to there's shaming everywhere oh my god all you need to do is scroll instagram for five minutes yeah. feminine's gotta look a certain way and yeah. you can't be too masculine but you still gotta take care of yourself and it's like oh my mm -hmm. god and that's really not the way we should be looking at it whereas you're right it's about what's true and embodied for you being able to really know that you can be with yourself in the fullness and be okay no matter what there's a richness to that this remembrance of how powerful we are as women is so important i love it i feel like all of this conversation has just come back to having the choice what has changed my life fundamentally has been like really having the courage to step into a life that is yours Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, babe. I'm so excited to be here. I honestly wish we just put a microphone between us at brunch the other day. I it was know. two hours of nonstop. <laughs> I'm thinking, wait, I just want to replicate that for this. I know. We're, I feel like our two hour brunch could have been like six hours. So we'll just like pick it up and like, <laughs> there is still so much more we're going to talk about. So. I love it. So one thing that I, the place that I want to dive in, in yeah. this episode is actually a place where I know a lot of my women are. Yeah. And that is, you know, a couple of years ago, we were talking the other day and you were saying it felt like, you know, you needed to slow down a little bit, yeah. but you didn't. Yeah. And it's almost like the universe is like, if you don't listen, I will make you listen. Yeah. Take me back yeah. to where you were at that point. Talk, talk to me about your lifestyle, your mm -hmm. business, just where you were at that point. Yeah. Such a strong point, even just there. It's like life will create the situations for it to happen. Do you want it to happen on your terms or will you just like be kicked into it? And I feel like for sure I was like kicked into it. I was, you know, multiple years into running my business, um, super driven by just like, and I know we'll get into that, like the proving, the chasing, the creating, like I've got to keep getting over there, that place over there when I'll finally like land, right, in my life. And I was... Um, planning like four international events. I'd just come back from overseas of running events in LA and London and I was planning my TED talk. I was doing rehearsals and there was just so many things. Like, it was just all, this, all these things. And there was just one day when I was writing in my journal and I was like, all right, when I get through, you know, the launch, the events, the TED talk, like when I get through and I just in that moment landed where I was like, I'm literally just getting through my life. Like I'm just ticking all these boxes in the hope that someday all of a sudden I'm going to arrive in my life. And it was just like such a sobering moment for me because also at that time I had basically with all of that happening, I literally got to this point where I didn't get out of bed for like three weeks. And I'm, I'm someone who like, even when things are going on, I'm always okay. Like I'm always like, all right, there's a lot going on, but like, I'm okay. And it was like, whoa, I really tasted this feeling of like, maybe I, this isn't okay. Like I really felt that and I was so unmotivated. Nothing meant anything. I just couldn't find the energy to get up and get going. And it was just that moment where I realized like I'm, when's the moment that I land in my life and allow myself to actually be present there? Um, and that really was a big, you know, we spoke about this the other day, like a big initiatory moment of when like how I was living my life on that track kind of started to come off and go, okay, I think I need to like, <laughs> slowly go on another track um and really sobered me up into realizing like okay what I'm doing right now is not sustainable and also maybe isn't the way I want to keep moving forward in my life I relate so much to that moment of when you were journaling and you started to realize you were just kind of moving through life towards yeah. this finish line mm -hmm. and the finish line is what death <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and we are chasing, you know, I will be happy when, I will yeah. feel more secure when, I will be confident when. Yeah. And I remember this exact moment. I it's so funny because I feel like those moments you always remember where you were. Totally. I remember this exact moment for me, and it was just being so busy, so much going on. Mm -hmm. I remember Noemi was actually sick at the time, it was about six months. It was the first time she'd had her first flu, which it's just such a big deal. Everything's totally. a big deal when you're a yeah. first time parent. But I was I had so many meetings in my calendar. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I forgot I was the boss. <laughs> so right. I'm like, I have all these meetings in my You're calendar. You're like, I've done this. <laughs> yeah. And then I took a beat just in between Zoom meetings and took a breath and realized, wait a minute, I'm in a beautiful house mm -hmm. with my soulmate husband, mm -hmm. the most gorgeous little baby. 
what the heck am I chasing? Yeah. And it's so interesting. You're mm-hmm. like, I, what am I chasing? What's there? And for me, it was like a soul searching moment of figuring out where that came from. Yeah. Have you ever gone back into childhood to think about when you started the busyness and chasing? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, have I gone into childhood? <laughs> well, babe, <laughs> yes. I mean, that's like, and I know you, we speak a lot and I know we'll get into it, like the nervous system work and like there's so many little flip-offs we can have from any one of these conversations. But literally, I remember, it's so crazy. I remember being like five years old and, you know, the vision of like, oh, I'm going to grow up and be a ballerina. Like, I literally remember having the thought that I want to grow up and be a CEO of a multinational corporation. Me and you would have been besties. I know, couple happy besties. (laughs) (laughs) We're like, this is the vision. And I just remember like having that thought from like such a young age. And there was just this like, yeah, it was like this driving and this achievement. It was very like achievement focused. Um, very, very much like I was a, you know, high performing student. I got scholarships to university. Like it was just very much like that was the, the metric. And also like, I think being fellow Capricorn too, like finances and proving, like it just was very much like a underpinning energy. Um, and, and also, you know, it spun off into, and we talk about this in our program, like these, the, these key hooks, like achievement was one achievement finances, um, body was one. And again, that came in so early on as well. Um, and they're just like these, these hooks that my sense of self latched onto that I needed to then start chasing that became like a through, through, um, theme for like my whole life, but literally from such a young age. Talk to me a little bit about what that means. Those hooks, cause in your program, yeah. I'm a student, very yeah, proud student. So good. talk to me about what that means. Yeah, totally. Well, and it's like, it's like what you just mentioned before, which is such a big thing. Like, even if one thing lands from this podcast, I feel like for people to slowly wake up to realize that when I, then I'll mentality that is so insidious that runs through like everything. And so when I talk about hooks, my big, big, big hooks that again, I've only just slowly started to bring them back into that, to that, like, I'm already there energy um, was like my body. So it was like, I always, my entire life, my sense of safety, my sense of self-worth, my sense of okayness was hooked out onto, oh, I've got to look this way. Oh, this is how I've got to look. My body has to look this way da, 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 for me to be safe, loved, worthy, all of that. Right. And then the same thing with like finances, achievement, da, da, I've got to be someone, I've got to prove my worth. I've got to like, and those are those externally placed anchor points for me feeling like safe and alive and worthy in the world. And of course, when when it's out there, you just never get there because it's, it's, it's hooked onto something that's entirely, um, it's not sustainable. Cause then it's always like for me, my body, that means I spent 30 years of my life dieting, exercising, binging, restricting, overworking my body, completely um, outsourced and contingent on something that was never gonna like allow me to fully drop into my life. And especially when we're talking about so much of this work of the muse, is like embodiment and bringing women back into like that felt and lived experience of themselves and of their lives and also of feeling safe. When we're completely disconnected from our body, like there's no way for us to ever really fully land there. So I spent like 35 years of my life completely disembodied and like at war with almost like the felt experience of my life. So Mm. I know that's like a big meaty place we could go, go on, but... Yeah, we're going to get into all of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so going back to when you were five and you're like, I'm going to be a CEO of a mega company. Were yeah. you seeing that around you? Were you rewarded mm. for achievement? Like, what was it do you think that even had you think that's what you want to be? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think that there was definitely like a, I think there was something that was innate. Like, right. you know, we talk about like seeing kids when they're born, like these little innate things that are kind of there. Um, within them I think there was something that was innate and then there was also of course there was validation for uh, but it, it came really early so I don't think I was heavily conditioned yet into um, this is what makes you worthy but I think once you there was like that innate sense and then of course you start chasing that and then you get validated for it so it strengthens and it strengthens and then you realize you know because you're being brought up by parents that have their own version of the world that they think is going to make their child safe if they become this version of a person And so it started to become validated and then it started to be, you know, we spoke about this the other day, when a way of being actually is working for you, then you actually like, oh no, this works. It's good. I'm achieving. I'm creating. I'm moving forward in the world. 
Um, and again, there can be that fine line when something's really effective, but then also when something starts to like override. 100%. It's like talking, when we were talking about it, it's like this achievement addiction, this yeah. work addiction. And it's such a powerful addiction mm -hmm. that rewards you positively. Totally. You know, when you're drinking alcohol or taking drugs or anything yeah. like that, not to compare it, but those things have very negative side effects. Yeah. Whereas being addicted to work, which so many of us are now, mm -hmm. it rewards you with great paychecks yeah. and an amazing life. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, poor me, you got that old work addiction. Look how totally. that's working. Like yeah. you don't often want to change that because yeah. it works so well. But then, like you said, you ended up in bed for three weeks, yeah. just so burned out and exhausted. Yeah. Is that, was that what, when you were saying you were in bed for three weeks, was that a burnout point for you? Totally. It was just like so much overwhelm and holding so many pieces. And I think it was also just a piece of like the, uh, like the breaking point, right? Of like mm -hmm. also decades at that point of being so, because really what it represented was a nervous system that was driving all of this, this like this grasping. It's like grasping, like, okay, I've got to get a little more money. I've got to get a little more achievement. I've got to get a little more data. And so there was always like this activation of, I've just got to get over there. Like, and for decades, right? Like that was what ran a lot of the achievement. Um, and, you know, I know we, you talked about this on the podcast too, like for a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of high-performing people, there's a lot of that that's actually driving it, right? Because it does, has a positive payoff because it allows you to create success. Um, and coming from that place can only get you so far. And I think that was, that was how far that nervous system strategy got me. Um, and then it was like we said earlier, life gave me the opportunity to go, okay, is this, is this how we're going to do things moving forward? Because the thing was, it was, I could never fully feel anything that I created, right? Mm -hmm. Like, cause I, it was, there was, ne it was never enough. It was un insatiable, like, okay, more, 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 right? Which is why I ended up with, you know, four international events, a TED talk, a launch, all these things on the plate at the same time. Um, so yeah, I forgot what your question was, but. <laughs> no, that's perfect. And that's the thing. For a lot of us, it's only sustainable for a certain amount of time. And thank goodness, because for some people, they only realize they didn't live yeah. until it's too late. Yeah. And so to realize this so young for us, I think is yeah. incredibly powerful. And I think yeah. that's why it's so important to talk about because yeah. for me, I grew up with nothing and my nervous system went into overdrive of money is safety. Mm -hmm. So I need to create safety. And it was always you know, one thing in my head, I, I would have savings and I would always think about, okay, if my business goes away tomorrow, I'll yeah. be okay for X amount of time. Yes. <laughs> I can do six months. I can do a year, whatever it was. And mm -hmm. I still have to catch my, it's not like one and done. Like I still have to yeah. catch myself in, in that thinking because my nervous system mm -hmm. grew up like that and it's so yeah. ingrained. So let's talk a bit about nervous system yeah. stuff. Where was your nervous system at and how did you start to recognize you know, that it ne you needed to do a bit of nervous system work or a bit or a lot. <laughs> yeah, a bit or a lot. And like to your point there too, like it's ongoing. Like I think, you know, it's like you, especially when it's wired a certain way, like just it's a practice to just continuously bring ourselves back to that center. It's not like, ah, regulated nervous system. Boom, done, you know. Done forever. Repatterned forever. Obviously it gets easier and you get like a new anchor point for where you live. But, you know, and I think just kind of drawing that correlation, I know you speak it on here a lot, but just as well around that safety piece, like that's, that's really this whole nervous system work, but I wasn't even aware of it like at all. And I had been in personal development. I mean, by the time I had had my sort of meltdown, I was like maybe only like five or six years in, um, but doing a, like doing a lot of the work, but not from really that system energetic embodied or like emotional level. Cause like I lost my dad when I was 24. That was one of the catalysts to get me into personal development. Um, but still, I don't feel like I really allowed even the emotional aspect of that until maybe like 10 years later because I didn't have the capacity, again, in my system, like in my nervous system, to really feel safe in being able to hold that. So like the nervous system work is such the missing piece for especially like creating sustainable shifts in how we can show up. Um, but for me, when I was coming from my head the whole time, like the proving achievement, all of that, um, 
I wasn't even aware of this thing. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of the reasons why I was acting out the patterns because in my nervous system, it was wired for that graspy, chasey, slightly anxious energy. So it just, for me, just felt like that's how I am. Like, it's like, oh, this is just how I am. This is how I show up. This is how I am. There wasn't even an awareness that there was a different way or that there was a piece of this work that I was missing, which is all this nervous system work and this embodiment work. That's why we focus so much like on the embodiment because for women, it's like, like the experience of our life and our wisdom like lives here like in our body but if we don't have um again like a, even the awareness to know that we can access this new it's like a whole new gear it's like oh wait it's like a whole world of things that i can start to shift and move around um but again it's not something that we are taught or talk about or have examples for and I think especially as well, if it feels like we have to choose between, and that's why I love that you're focusing on this so much, like a high-performing, amazing woman showing like, oh, we can still create things and still be like regulated and soft and in our bodies. It doesn't have to be either or. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And I think that's really important because when we talk about the nervous system work, we can also dive into your feminine and masculine. And I think all of that really encompasses this somatic yeah. work. And I think it's really important for women like us to talk about it mm. because I also will say I have been put off in the past from mm. exploring this work because mm -hmm. of the way it's been yeah. kind of spoken about. You know, I think there are some people that will talk about getting in your feminine and mm -hmm. No mention of the masculine at all, and it's like yeah. being in the masculine if you're a woman is wrong, yeah. and 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 the the shaming. Have mm -hmm. you ever felt shamed for being oh my in your gosh. masculine? <laughs> like I've been actively told by like certain people. I mean, not any more so much, but like for sure, it's like it's it's in it. There is shame embedded in that. Like mm -hmm. yeah, you're so in your masculine. You're so in your masculine. Like I've had that story for so long. Mm -hmm. And then the feminine masculine thing, you're like, you're so right. There's so many layers to it. And that's why even in the work that we do, it's like, we'd call it integrated and embodied wholeness for women. Cause it's like, we need both. If you're just in your feminine, like that's a mess, <laughs> you know, like totally. both are beautiful, but there is this stigma and shaming of like, and there's also a total misassociation of like, for a lot of what we women, even within ourselves, I think until we come into this, confuse masculine with hypervigilance and survival. And those are two very different things. And they get put in the same bucket. And then we shame ourselves for being masculine. It's like, no, 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 we're just, we're in our nervous system patterns of like trying to survive and being hypervigilant. And they're two very different things. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, it's just like, again, now that we're kind of, I think the, the, the world of feminine and masculine work is becoming a little bit more, um, open to us like because we had the big the boss babe era and the you know conscious boss that was my business and like very much like in the high performing woman era which is yes all day for that and now we're like in the softening right mm -hmm. of that and we're welcoming more of what it means to be feminine in but not even just to be like we have a resistance to this in our program too it's not about just being feminine it's about being a woman it's like how does being a woman look like for you and like being able to have you know, for the masculine, it's like strength, containment, decisiveness, um, like wholeness, being able to hold and be, create your own safety within yourself. Um, but hypervigilance is like so often confused of that because we're, when we're in this like hyper producing, proving, like I think about me and my poor conscious boss era, like building the businesses, doing all the things. Of course, there was like a uh, masculine in it, right? But there was, it was the, the energy behind it was <laughs> grasping controlling hypervigilant never like never actually feeling safe always needing to produce to like finally like get and that's not masculine energy right that's hypervigilance and it's survival and and there's a total difference I am so freaking grateful that you're <laughs> bringing this up <laughs> because yes 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 I hear this all the time yeah. and it drives me nuts because what you're talking about is doing that nervous system regulation work and that being the foundation for even being able to explore what it looks like to be in healthy masculine, what it looks like to be in healthy feminine. And for a lot of us who are really high performing, high achieving, we probably do have a really healthy masculine yeah. because we grew up in a patriarchy. Mm -hmm. We grew up seeing examples of CEOs mainly being men. So we yeah. had a really great example of that. Yeah. And so there's a lot of healthy masculine within us where we can set goals, we can set deadlines, we can really go at them and achieve them. 
we can take care of ourselves, we can be incredibly independent. I think that is such a wonderful trait that women have now. And I think it gets to be celebrated versus shamed. Mm -hmm. And then the feminine element, like you're saying, when you do that nervous system regulation work, it's a lot of us didn't have a healthy feminine Mm -hmm. because we grew up in a patriarchy and you often see the feminine as submissive, as weak. And when you have those connotations, you tend to move away from that and move into the thing that's safe. Yeah. And I... I realized that actually at Hoffman, we've both done Mm -hmm. Hoffman. I talk about Hoffman all the time. It's so powerful. And I honestly went into it thinking I had like more daddy issues, more like around Mm. the masculine Mm. and going into it, it was the opposite for me. Interesting. And I had so many negative connotations toward what I thought the feminine was, Mm. but Hoffman was the beginning for me of, of really regulating my nervous system and it's continued since. But doing that has allowed me to then feel safe enough to look at what the feminine is and Mm -hmm. integrate both. And I think that's the powerful thing is integrating both so that actually we can get that amazing presence and vulnerability and creativity from the Mm -hmm. feminine Mm -hmm. alongside being able to go out there and get shit done. Yeah. What is your experience of the feminine and how do you explain it? Yeah, it's such a great question because I think the landscape of masculine and feminine is like so nuanced and so deep and it's like a it's like a bucket that you could you could just go and swim in for so long, like truly. And and that's why like in the work that we do and that I've sort of come to know that even sometimes I like I sort of just mentioned briefly before, have a hesitancy of like even saying like this is feminine, this is masculine, right? Because it's like again, sometimes there's, there's shoulds in it and there's conditioning and there's stigma. And it's like, okay, so if I'm not that, am I not a woman? Am I not feminine? And it's really about like, for me, I think really having the sense of empowerment to, to really choose for you. Like how do you show up and what feels really good for you? And that again, like really interplays with that inner sense of safety and that regulation. I think they play really beautifully together because we, you know, I know for me, before I sort of came to this work, there was a moment where I felt like um, I couldn't, like I was almost like waiting because I'm single, right? I'm single, I'm dating. And that's been a whole thing for nervous system work. Wow. Um, But it's like, I was waiting almost like to be saved. And I was kind of in my, like, we sort of call it like the shadow feminine. um, Because again, I was almost like my, my masculine or that sense of inner containment. Because if we think about masculine and feminine, really like if we're to, to give a basic concept and especially how it interplays within ourselves, it's like the masculine is like the sense of containment and then the feminine gets contained by that and feels safe. But also like we have to do that within ourselves. And that's why this work is so powerful because when we can create that inner containment and safety, right? The regulation, the, the strong sense of masculine, now having our own back, discernment, boundaries, all of that. Then the more feminine side of us can be more expressed. Right. And so like sometimes there can be this um, just like a lack of when we don't have that full safety, we can't allow the fullness of ourselves to come on and really being able to have both of those because it's not about, um, oh, now I just want to be in my feminine and and like just there's just it can be a lot of like stigma around it. And I think it's really about like, who are you in your wholeness? Like, who do you get to be in your wholeness and how does that look? Because, again, like now that there's all this feminine exploration now it's like oh now all of a sudden we have to look and be like that but it's like you get to create your own anchoring within yourself and then show up how that feels really good for you because something that um that exploration has done for me and we see a lot in our program of muse too is also like when we take that shame and stigma away of how a modern woman is supposed to show up um how like what comes online for you when you give yourself permission to be that like for me it's like being like really allowing myself to receive, feeling softer, feeling more vulnerable, feeling um, like a little bit more traditional in terms of what I'm looking for in a relationship. And like, there was a lot of stigma around that before and a lack of like self-worth to know that I could receive that, that doing a lot of this work has just, again, it's allowing the fullness of what feels good for me to come online and not even needing to label it a type of way. Mm, That makes so much sense. So I'm hearing it's more what's by design, not default. Yeah. Like if you were to choose to have the choice of how you operate, what would you choose versus just operating the way you always have by default? Yeah. And it's like, it's, 
so much of what has changed my life fundamentally has been like really having the courage to step into a life that is yours, right? Without even the labels and the stigma and the shoulds and the conditioning. And it's like, if, if, if none of that was quote unquote true, like who would I be? How would I act? How would I show up? How would I allow myself to experience my life? And that's why, that's why sometimes these, they're, they're so helpful to talk about because it gives us anchor points and concepts. And then it's like, we have to kind of go, okay, take it to the point that it's helpful and then like allow it to be like, okay, who do you now? What do you choose? How do you want to show up without again, feeling like you have to fit into another box or tick another thing? Because I think there's a lot of that happening in the feminine world. Like now we were shamed for being too masculine. Now we're not feminine enough or it doesn't look like that. And it's like, oh my gosh, (laughs) when does it stop? Oh my God, all you need to do is scroll Instagram for five minutes and you yeah. see it. There's shaming everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Feminine's got to look a certain way and yeah. you can't be too masculine, but you still got to take care of yourself. And it's like, oh my mm-hmm. God, there's so much advice out there. Yeah. Whereas you're right, it's about what's what's true and embodied for you. And I also love that you're, let's get into the, the dating stuff and mm-hmm. this in relationship because that's definitely been something that <laughs> I've been on the journey of learning because as part of, diving into the masculine feminine dynamic even seeing those words your the algorithm's going to start showing you more of that content yeah. and i was seeing so much of you need your man to lead you you mm-hmm. need a man who does xyz yeah. and the way you guys would describe it in your program is well that's you just put a putting a hook on a relationship yeah. that i will only be in my feminine if he's in his masculine yeah and that's really not the way we should be looking at it yeah tried it doesn't work yeah yeah (laughs) you're like tried it trust me but yeah doesn't work yeah and if you need somebody else to change or be a certain way for you to show up how you want to show up I think we're doing something wrong totally I mean and that's the thing like I realized because so much of so much truly if I boil down a lot of like what's shifted for me in our program of muse it's like allowing figuring out how you can be fully alive in your life right now and not assuming somewhere over there once you tick all the boxes and everybody behaves right and all the conditions are perfect that you can fully like land in your life and have the experience because again it's contingent on something that's inherently unstable and outside of yourself so if your experience of your life of your relationship of yourself is somehow hooked outside there's no sustainability to that and there's no inherent safety right and we keep talking about that but to feel really safe and landed in your body is what gives you the experience of your life that you really want because you can be present, you can be attuned, um, you're you're not contingent and you're more resourced. And so again, when we talk about relational dynamics, um, that was one of the pieces that I realized was a really insidious and it's so many women come into our program for relational stuff, right? Because as women, we're very relational. So we want to figure out like, that's just a big piece. And the nervous system stuff is so key. Like, me after being in the work for so like over a decade 15 years right it was only about two years ago that I realized like that I sat because I was like 36 or I'm 37 now and I was like all right I've wanted partnership for a long time I'm still not in the type of partnership that I'm looking for maybe this is something that (laughs) maybe there's something that I could look at right and that's what dove me into really looking at the, the ways that my nervous system was wired for what I was calling in which was unavailable you know, men that wouldn't really choose me that I was grasping for. And that was when I really started to notice and look through, because the thing is the way that we show up always makes sense. Like why we are the way we are. If you sit down with someone and figure out their story, our patterns, our defense mechanisms, all of that always makes sense, right? They're, they are there because your system thinks that acting this way will create safety for you in the world. And what your nervous system and your body thinks is safe oftentimes doesn't correlate with actually what creates a great life, right? So my body's like, yeah, unavailability in my system, that's safe. Because my dad was unavailable. He was in and out of our home. It was, it was, it was emotionally um, unstable. And so within my system, as we, I, I know you talk about nervous system work a lot, but that's why it in. So then therefore that's when my body, that's where my body wants to go to create that. That's what feels normal, right? That's what feels safe. And so it's, the nervous system stuff is so key because I last time when I was doing a lot of this work and I was really actively working on going like, okay, so that pattern doesn't work for me. Like I know that um, that's not what I want to call in. I knew I had to really do that work to re-pattern, being able to have the system that could hold the type of relating that I desired. And it was wild to me to see, because logically I'm like, 
oh yeah, I, I, of course I want an emotionally available person that chooses me and cherishes me and feels safe. And, and when that person showed up, my system was like, Ooh. <laughs> it was like, what's this? We don't like it. And I had to like actively re like, and I was getting support in it, but I could really, I could tangibly feel like, holy wow, like I want this thing, but yet my, I don't have capacity to hold it. And that's so big with the nervous system work. And that's such a big thing that we do because it's like, you can want something like beautiful relating, being seen, being held, being led, like even these pieces, like being led. I wasn't even the space to hold leadership or being held, like to, to be soft or to be receptive to that. And so you actually have to really look at, and it's pretty easy to notice because you can just look at like, okay, what's showing up? <laughs> what's continuously showing up? And also like, what's maybe a story that I've had for a really long time that hasn't shifted? And that's going to give you a really good like telltale sign of like what's normal and safe in my system because we can want something, but if it can, something else is continuously showing up, it's a pretty good sign to say like that's where my nervous system feels comfortable. Um, and there's no, no greater way to see that than like in relationships. Um, but, but again, like having – that's why having your own way and place – to regulate because I think as women we definitely can get in that loop of like the man will be my safety or like mm-hmm. I for sure had that like he'll save me like there's a little bit of like that wounded feminine that can get into that um and fully being able to be that like become your beloved first and foremost and then have that anchor point of like okay so how do I then choose to relate from that place game changer for me yeah what what do they say wherever you go there you are yeah right that, that old chestnut <laughs> but it is true it's those themes in your life in and they do often show up for me they've shown up so much in say business relationships yeah where it's been very similar patterns mm-hmm. and you have to then take responsibility and say if I want different yes. I need to regulate to different clearly yeah. there's a reason I'm not just getting bad luck there is clearly a yeah. reason the same thing keeps happening over and over again girl the the honestly the one thing you just did that's so key is the self-responsibility it's so fundamental to like all of this and it's it's inconvenient right because it's like it's so much easier to kind of go oh they did that this did that if this happened like we're, we're sort of trained in that more more of that mindset but everything shifts when you can finally actually go like like me at 35 being like oh maybe it's because i travel all this there's no good guys around blah blah it's like all right, girl, maybe, <laughs> maybe you've been choosing the wrong guys and you've been running the show and like we could shake some things up. But it's like, that's when everything can shift because then again, like I feel like for me, so much of like what makes me so passionate about this work is it's like, it gives you access to fully become alive in your life right now. And when we're, when we're outsourced and we're out hooked and we're not taking responsibility, the experience of our life is always somewhere over there and something changes and somebody else acts different and da, 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 da. And it's like, it's actually just all like, and then we say this um, saying, it's like nothing has to change for everything to be different. And it's crazy. It came to me in a plant medicine ceremony, like 2018 in the midst of my shit thing shifting. And I feel like it only really landed for me fully to understand it like a year ago into this work of just like your the experience of your life the conditions the partner the business your family your body all of that like that's not the thing that has to change for everything to shift and it's like we were talking about this the other day like the internal texture like the texture of our lives in my life it's fundamentally shifted from doing this work because you can land in your life right now and have the experience of your life without all of those other things having to shift and ironically they still shift because how you show up in your life is like so much more powerful and attuned and like tapped in and discerning and strong because you're fully resourced so those things still change but your sense of the experience of your life is no longer like reliant on that that is so powerful and actually just hearing that it's making me think of so many things in my life where actually my nervous system pattern has been to to make big drastic changes Mm. growing up I was always moving house, always moving school. There was yeah. always a fresh start. Yeah. And it changed things. And yeah. that was great. So my nervous system has always related to if you don't like how something is going, make a big change, whether it's yeah. change your relationship, change where you're living, mm-hmm. get a different house, a different apartment, 
a different business. Mm -hmm. But what I've really noticed is what you're saying, nothing has to change for things to be different is when I sit in that really uncomfortable place of, (laughs) all right, you might want to move house right now or you might want to divorce your husband because he's annoying you right now. (laughs) He's blending a smoothie again. (laughs) Exactly. Actually, if you can sit with this edge and do the work, Mm -hmm. your nervous system is going to become more comfortable and you can actually change without having to move your life. Yeah. Upheave your life. Yep. But it's not easy sitting with that edge and doing the nervous system work. Girl. Which brings me to Muse because this is Mm -hmm. a really, really powerful program. And I love, Alexi's been on the podcast a few times. I love the way this program was born. I think Mm. any of the best products and services Mm -hmm. are born out of solving your own problem. Yeah. So what problem was it solving for the two of you? Yeah, totally. And I, well, we'll loop back in because to what you said needs to be underlined. Like... (laughs) Whilst this work is almost like simple, like once you get, you figure out how important this stuff is, it's, there's tools and practices and ways you can start to really regulate and create this capacity, but it doesn't mean it's easy. It's right? awful. It's <laughs> awful. It's like no wonder. And that, that also loops back to your point as well of, of, you know, the productivity. And again, we live in a society that values, like that values the outsourcing of the discomfort, the shopping, the food, the porn, the overachievement, like the achievement is just such a socially accepted one. But there's all these forms of externalization that are just a part of our society. We don't have a society that is, um, that values, oh, being a really resourced, regulated human. And there's a reason why that stuff is so prevalent because it is it's so uncomfortable to sit with your edge and just sit with that like discomfort of what you're in. And And to answer your question with Lex and I, that was really how this was born. Like we both at the same time went through this like (laughs) life, life initiated (laughs) us, right? Because we, you know, both of us believe that life is always inviting you into your next expansion. Didn't know that at the time. It was just like- Never do. No, you're just like in it going, what is happening? And we just really had this very, very intense, you know, she was in Austin, I was in New Zealand, I had just lost my auntie. And I was just in this stage of my life where I was like, everything internally, like it felt gray, it felt, I was crying every day, I was like, in this deep unknown, but like, you know, thinking all my friends were angry at me, I felt alone, I felt betrayed, there was just like, all of this intense emotion. And and Lex, I know she's spoken a bit about her experience on the podcast, and she was going through her own version. And it was hell, like it was just a really deep emotional time, but it was almost like it was so intense that there was no escaping it, right? It was like, the, the, it was, you know, we talk about inside of Muse about unkinking the hose, right? Because as, as a society and as women, we're so used to, uh, and pushing down a lot of the, our emotional landscape, which essentially when we allow, which is the discomfort, when we fully allow, we feel it, which is like when we want to squirm and get away from it, it it expands us. That is a part of the expansion of what allows us more capacity to be the fullness of ourselves and to be full in the world. Um, And I feel like life just really cracked us both open in our own way. Um, And it was getting through that and, and almost like not having a choice, but to sit, but to feel, but to be essentially like initiated by life into the, into that experience and kind of coming through it and supporting each other through that and then getting to the other side of it and feeling more alive, more attuned, more full, more radiant, more turned on, like more just like, whoa. And just being like, holy, what is this? Like, what is this feeling of our life? And again, it was that nothing had to change for everything to be different because we just felt like, who is this person? <laughs> like, and, and again, like nothing had really shifted, but our ability to feel and hold and be fully lit up in our lives was like night and day and we're like all right something and we were sitting around the pool at Soho House in Austin and we just had this conversation of like what would it be like what would it feel like to be the muse of your own life and from that we just sort of started on this further journey of um just really following that desire and what lights us up and what feels good and and then from there realizing that that pathway actually wasn't a substitute for work or achievement it was like the new way for us to actually like follow like oh this feels good oh and also look all of a sudden like that's what led us to creating this business and that's why we're so passionate about really being attuned and to this like new way where it doesn't have to feel like you know and following that as women and allowing that to be the 
um, the texture of how you create instead of like there's such a conditioning of uh, one day, you know, one day when I have done everything or fully safe, I'll go to the dance class or I'll figure out what turns me on or I'll figure out what means something to me. And really trusting like through that process, we realized that going through that journey is the way to all of those answers. But that's very countercultural. It is. I, it's very ca- countercultural because I feel like even when we get into so much of this, like not having a lot of energy, maybe not having huge sexual desire. Yeah. So much of this can be put down to your hormones. Mm-hmm. Your hormones are off. Your diet's off. You're not doing enough of this. Mm-hmm. And listen, I'm massive biohacker so I believe in all of that and as a biohacker I will say some of the most profound shifts in my health Mm. have come from deep somatic work yes most profound yeah because when we look at the issues and I'm saying this as not a medical doctor and this is not medical medical advice but when we look at all of the conditions that we have as a society now Mm. versus you know, many, many years ago, yes, we're using more chemicals and shit and all kinds that we ever have. Mm. And when you look at epigenetics yeah. and you really study mm-hmm. how that shows up in generations and yeah. that trauma, yeah, that's really freaking powerful. Mm-hmm. But it's really hard for people to fully grasp because it's this kind of deep work that you can't see in a blood test. Yeah. Whereas you can see the hormones being off in a blood test. Mm-hmm. You can see, you can feel your energy being off. You cannot see in a blood test this generational trauma that's still lingering in your body. Yeah. yeah. And so as humans, we want evidence mm-hmm. and we want to look for it or we want a quick fix. Yeah. This stuff isn't a quick fix. For me, anytime in CEO Mama, we, we have a lot of somatic ceremonies. And anytime we open that kind of ceremony, I always kind of share what somatic work has done for me and how it's changed my health and my life. Um, Even when we were talking the other day about Joe Dispenza, when I went to his uh, advanced week long, I manifested being like one, there was 20 of us selected out of like 2000 where we got to have brain scans and blood work done before the event and after the event. And all it was, quote unquote, all (laughs) was meditation. Yeah. But seeing the change in your blood markers was phenomenal. Yeah. So I like to preface that just because I know we do have a lot of people listening like, okay, but I need the evidence, Natalie, and my hormones are off. Cool. And like you're talking about being turned on by life, feeling, experiencing life more than you ever have so much of this. You weren't necessarily, you know, changing your biomarkers through yeah. supplements and red light and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. So let's talk about that piece of it. Yeah. What kind of deeper work were you diving into? Mm, yeah, it's a great question and such a great point. And I think it also really, for me, loops into the point as well as like, we're so habituated in being externalized. Like, okay, so if the doctor tells me and this supplement and you know better than, it's like, again, externalizing our wisdom, our intuition, it's like, and it's all like, let's use everything we can. Like, let's use everything we can, but let's also really trust and know like we're always our biggest, like our intuition, life. Like if we're attuned, we're going to see and know like what our next step is to like get to where it is we want to go, whether it's health, whether it's in our life and really like bringing that, um, that wisdom and that trust back in as the center point, even to know which supplements and which people, because like, again that that was like me dieting from a whole life oh this thing will tell me what I should put in my body instead of like what does my body ask for and really being able to and you know Joe Dispenza talks about this you know your nervous system is more powerful than any pharmaceutical or any like we have so much power in there um and in terms of the work honestly like so much of it is what we mentioned about like being being fully available like the feeling the space the sitting in the the leaning into like a the, the mental awareness, firstly, is, is like it's a combo. So you have to sort of have some some awareness, like the, the, the decades of work that I did before is obviously not, not helpful because I was very aware of my inner child, of some of the patterns that I might have had. So having that mental awareness of, and you can just look at your life and see, right? Go, okay, that's a recurring theme, right? We have a lot of uh, people that you can see relationally, like, oh, they keep calling in toxic partners or abusive partners. And then it's like, oh, you look up and you go, oh, mother and father were addicts. And so that's the the blueprint. So you can look around your life and see what some of your patterns might be. And then truly like so much of it is like sitting. And the moment you want to, you know, I have a, a saying like the activation is the invitation. 
So when you're feeling, oh, your husband, or oh, at like looking at your bank account, like that, that activated state, which is that dysregulated nervous system, instead of the reflex, like yelling or shopping or da da da, like the 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 get is okay. I'm being invited right now into like the the capacity my nervous system has. So like, how do I sit and hold and heal and feel? what's there like that's the thing it's it's not like it doesn't have to be so complicated so much of it is that but it, again that's also really uncomfortable um and then so that's really what i was doing like really being available and a yes to what was like all of that discomfort all of that uh pain sadness grief like the heaviness that needed to like essentially make space because for however many years of my life like 30 plus years of my life i was totally disembodied and disconnected. Like I mentioned, I barely even cried when my dad died. I was so numb. And so there was just like almost like backlog. It's like you've got to let like whatever was there move because it's just stuck energy. And then when we move that, again, we talk about capacity and becoming more resourced in our system. When we clear out what was there, then we have more space. So we're therefore more resourced. So, so much of it comes down to that. And then the rest is just like, uh, you know, nervous system tools, like what gets you back to feeling more safe, feeling more, more resourced, you know, there's tapping, there's inner child work, there's meditation, there's getting in nature, there's embodiment practices, like, but so much of it is really just getting you back into your body, into feeling safe. So you have more, more of your resource self to come online. And so whatever that looks like, that's really the work that I was doing. I love this so much. So for someone listening who notices they have a pattern of, let's say, getting triggered by their mm -hmm. partner and yeah. they notice the anger come up and yeah. instead of feeling it, one of the biggest numbing tools, mm -hmm. I think, is scrolling Instagram or scroll, oh, yeah. like on your phone, just uh -huh. being busy on your phone, picking up your phone. If I stare at this long enough, it'll calm me down. <laughs> How, how's that working out for everybody? <laughs> That's it. And I think it's numbing out to what the actual emotion is. Mm -hmm what tool would you recommend say someone's used to doing that they yeah. feel an activated state they pick up their phone they start scrolling till they yeah. feel calm again mm -hmm. let's say okay the pattern interrupt is yeah. you do not pick up your phone you leave your phone right there mm -hmm. but if they are very new to this work yeah. and generally feel this well I'm just angry and it's stuck in my body mm -hmm. how can they get to the root of that yeah such a great question and that's the thing like it doesn't have to be it, there's not so many bells and whistles because the thing that makes it feel, because I think a lot of people also are afraid that if they allow it, it's never going to stop. And if they allow it, they're not going to get, like it's just too much. And so there's so much there. But really when we fully, like the irony, when we fully actually allow it, it passes through way faster than if we're just habitually pushing it down and we're constantly da da da, -da And that's why we're so reactive all the time because it's right there. And when we actually allow it, we're just, it doesn't have to take so long. So again, I would offer that invitation of like the activation is the invitation. So rather than that person has done this thing and da 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 and, and, and sitting there in the story of like, I'm, I'm pissed off and they didn't show up and they never choose me. And da, like that is the invitation into something that's just alive within you that is not from that moment. Like it's mm -hmm. not from that moment. So really just honestly, it just can be so simple and, and just prefacing. It's not always going to feel comfortable. That's why you want to go on your phone. But you can just start in micro moments, like just pop your phone down, start to just like, like close your eyes, start to just attune to your, to your body and start to just get like uh, familiar with your own sensory landscape, right? So what that means, and by the way, I was the person that hated doing this like when people would say where do you feel that in your body <laughs> and I'd be like what body what for what feeling what are you talking about like you used to drive me wild because I just I didn't have any connection to like my and when we're talking about this work especially for women like bringing back sensuality and connection and intuition like all of that like lives here and so building that connection so I would just start and like if you don't feel anything if you feel numb if you're not that's also just information. Like it's a practice. I think that's such a big thing. You're not just going to instantly know how to regulate your nervous system or fully be attuned with what's there or be comfortable, but just slowly starting to build that practice of getting connected to ooh, what's alive. Like you might be like, okay, I feel like often I feel something in my stomach. I feel a tightness in my chest. I feel a little bit in my throat. 
and you're just starting to like give uh, give space for what's alive and you're also giving it permission to be there because it's just the sensation, it's just a feeling. And for a lot of us, it's stuff that's never been felt that just like wants a moment, like, and then we can obviously add on like inner child work too is a whole other um, aspect of it. But often when we're in that activated moment, it is the little one. It's that version of us from a long time ago that never had the space to feel and never had the resources to, to know what to do with all of that energy. I think about my little, my little me growing up and like your little Natalie and like that chaos and in that house and don't have the tools like to, to be with that energy. So when we're older and we're more resourced, that's the practice we can start to be in is just to really allow, um, ask ourselves what it is we need and really tend to it. And that's how we slowly start to create that inner safety because we are capable of giving ourselves all the things we're thinking that life needs to give us. Like that will never sustain us any more than like really giving that to ourselves. So it's a long-winded answer, but it can be just as simple as what am I feeling? Where am I feeling that? And also being a, like, try not to get into the story. Like stay with the feeling versus the story of it. Mm, what's an example of the story? Like, like, um, oh my gosh, like he, he always does that. And like, I always, I, I feel, I feel betrayed. I feel I can't trust anybody. Like, oh my gosh. And then the story of all the things starts to add, like add more emotion and just really like allowing like, oh, okay. I'm feeling activated. I'm feeling this energy. I'm feeling like anxious. I'm feeling uh, alone. I'm feeling scared and just allowing it like allowing, giving it some space. And then it just like, it, it, it moves. And then you're more resourced, right? I think that's so, so powerful. Because like you say, we don't need all of the gurus. We don't need to, to mm. have our hooks around on the, that coach and that therapist and that person. Yes, yeah. all of these people are useful as mm -hmm. tools in your toolbox. Yeah. But I even say this when anyone comes to me for business advice. I always say, listen, I'll give you what I think, but no yeah. one knows better than you. Yeah. No one knows. But you know funnels. I don't, yes, but yeah. I don't know your business better than you. Yeah. I don't know you better than you. Yeah. And I think that's the important thing that we all have to recognize mm -hmm. is we all have so much innate wisdom, but it's so much easier to listen to somebody yeah. else mm -hmm. and think, well, I can't start doing this work until someone teaches me how. Yep. And it's like, well, have you just sat and listened to your body? Do, have you given yourself a chance to show how in tune you already are yeah. and what you already know? Yeah. But a lot of us don't because we are taught to look up to teachers and look up yeah. to people that are in more authority than we are. Totally. Yeah, but, and, it's, and it's like a piece of self-trust, right? Because when we don't have internal safety, it's very hard. Like we have sometimes had students that will say to me, like, I love how much faith you have in my adult self. Because like <laughs> there's a lot of like, you know, holding space for your little one when they're in these activated moments. But often it is when you're in these activated moments, it's not fully resourced adult you. It's the fear and the uncertainty of like this, this little one that doesn't have what she needs in that moment. And then we get to tend to it. But within that too is, is that feeling of like, oh, do I trust myself? Like, can I really hold space for myself? And that's again, a muscle and a practice. But again, until we cultivate that, it does. It feels safer and easier to trust you because I can look at what you've created. And so therefore, you know better than I do. So I'm going to trust you because mm -hmm. I don't actually know if I trust myself and I'm afraid of what might happen if I trust this little whisper. And I think that that's again, so much that we'll keep coming back to. It's a practice. It's a practice. It's a muscle. Like the more that we and again, doing it with like low stakes moments, like start to practice this in those little moments where you feel activated, start to trust your your discernment and your intuition in like little moments and start to really notice like, oh, I had that little insight and I did it and it worked out like, to, you know, and really over time starting to cultivate that sense of trust within yourself, I think is such a big thing for a woman because we do have more of this inherent, that person knows better and, you know, let, let me trust you because I don't actually know if I have my own back. So good. Yeah. And it's, I always think, just just think about, you know, do you trust yourself to listen to a friend when she's really upset? Mm. Do you trust yourself to hold space for her? Mm. And it's like, oh, yes, I'm very good at holding space for everyone else. Yes. So why wouldn't you be good at it with yourself? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's just, it is, it's just inherently a really uncomfortable experience. And so it's just knowing that, but also like, you know, titrating, like give yourself space to, to build up, like I'm at the point now, and obviously I'm not perfect and there's many times where I'll get activated, but I have a lot more awareness now too of, 
going like, oh, okay, super activated right now. Definitely not going to reply to that. Like <laughs> definitely not going to, you know, act on in that activated state. And that's such a piece of the, the practice too, of like, you know, not taking that as truth and allowing yourself to get back to a space until you can be more like trusting of your own decisions. But these days I'm a lot more comfortable with that discomfort. Like over time you do because you start to, this for me is what's so changed the game and and really feeling like I can trust myself, that I can trust life, that I can live, you know, I'm 37, I'm single. I've just moved to an entirely different continent. Like, you know, in a lot of ways society would tell, would judge me and think that I'm not like a success, you know, at this point of my life. But like these practices has been such a fundamental piece to really allow myself to trust myself, to live the life that really matters to me um, and it's these practices and having this building this muscle and this capacity has been such a crucial piece of also really cultivating like deep self attunement, but like self worth because you know like at the end of it like I've got me and not in a way that's like Ugh! and of course I have my moments, <laughs> but like being able to really um, know that you can be with yourself in the fullness and be okay no matter what and and really have you. There's a richness to that that is so powerful um, that that the more that we get into this work and we cultivate that, um, it starts to feel like more sweet to be in those practices. This is so good. Can you explain what titration is? Yes, great question. So titration is basically just like slowly over time, ex- essentially like expanding your capacity. So um, we talk about this like massively in nervous system work. So it's like, for example, an, an um, example of titration for me would be like as someone who had like a lot of body image stuff for my whole life. Like I never used to have my arms out. I never used to like, I would have more things like my, there was so much sensitivity because like my, my, my nervous system's like, you're being seen, we're uncomfortable. And so it's instead of like, all right, I'm going to go and walk out on the street naked and <laughs> blow your nervous system out, right? It's like, oh, maybe at this party, I'm going to wear something that I feel a little bit um seen in like a little and you get your nervous system and then over time your your sense of safety within your like yourself expands so it's just like a lot and so it's the same thing with like the emotional work the regulation like you don't have to sit there and just blow yourself out and feel everything but can you titrate can you sit with it a little more than maybe you did yesterday can you sit with it and slowly over time you fully expand your capacity and your nervous system's range i love this yeah Okay, and then another question that I have for you, you kind of, you mentioned a couple of things earlier, you were talking about dance class. Yeah. What are the, some of the fun things you've done that really has gotten you into feeling more of your full expression? Mm, What are some of those practices? I love that question. Yes. Um, I mean, dance classes have been really big for me and it's interesting, like this journey of muse has actually fully awoken me up to like, wanting to like perform and almost like like really start to create like a bit of art out of it which is so crazy to me because I've never been someone that's felt like I'm creative but I feel like this has been the flavor that's come out of really allowing that so I mean I've been going to dance classes since like 2019 we lived in LA I was going to a lot of classes there um that's been huge for me and especially for the titration this this one style of dance class that's like really more embodiment focused um and actually doing solos in front of people like which Mm. by the way the first class I ran out of because I was like we're gonna what now excuse me absolutely not like because my I was like no way and now like that's why it's so wild when we create that range it's like this whole other version can like come out because it's like there's safety in it um so I was totally the person that ran out of that class and then last you know we're at dinner at that place the other the other night here um and I share this just for reference point of like people that are like I could never do that and it's like I could never do that either (laughs) um you know and I ended up at the show and literally giving this person a lap dance which because it was drawn it was like this cabaret show and my system could hold that and that was so like wild and amazing and fun for me so that's been really big for me um but also because I had this desire and I share that because that's for me like it's so different for everybody like the fun thing that your muse maybe wants to play with um, is I always was like, I, I want to be that woman. I want to be the woman that has the capacity to not want to shy away from that. I want to be the woman that has the capacity to like be seen in that way. So I've just kind of like followed that little, um, that little excitement. 
Um, and, and the sensuality and the dance classes, like that's definitely like a piece of my flavor. Like she's a little like, you know, I say like drip drippy, she's dark, she's a little dirty, she's like really <laughs> sensual. So I just follow like that feels like a really fun expansion for me. Like I'm, I'm very much into, um, it's really just like liberation, like feeling sexually liberated, feeling sensually, sensually liberated. Like that's what feels alive for me. Um, so being in the environments where I feel like I'm expanding that edge feels really fun for me. I love talking about this stuff. Have you seen Dallas Cowboy Cheerleaders on Netflix? No, yet? but I've seen that you've been watching okay. it. <laughs> so let me talk about it. So I'm obsessed. If anyone hasn't watched it, it, you have to watch it. Yeah. It's amazing. But watching it, I just had such, it was like this overwhelming feeling of being proud to be a woman. Mm, because that. I was watching these women just absolutely in their element. Yeah. I mean, the way that they can dance and the way that, you know, you can't help but just be in their world. Yeah. They bring you into their world. And I had such a moment of the feminine is so fucking powerful. Preach. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to watch 36 men <laughs> in skimpy clothes dancing. Yeah. I would be so uninterested. You absolutely yeah. couldn't stretch that out for eight episodes. I mean, sure, <laughs> a little bit of magic mic here yeah, and there. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. But eight episodes of watching all of that, I would be so uninterested. Mm-hmm. And that's not me shitting on men. That's to say there is something so beautiful and most importantly, powerful mm. about women mm. and about the feminine. Mm. And I love that we get to have these conversations because for so long, it has been shut down Mm -hmm. and shamed. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was it? Only 50 years ago that women couldn't open a bank account if they weren't married. Wild. Isn't that crazy? It's wild. That's like yesterday, like not even long. It's not that long ago. Mm -hmm. You could not have a bank account if you were not married. What does that tell us as women? You are not worthy if you are without a man. You are not... Uh, useful in society Mm -hmm. if you are not with a man or birthing children Mm -hmm. and to see women in this day and age be so self-expressed and celebrated for it I mean yes we have a long way to go but it was so powerful for me Mm -hmm. and and coming back to that that's why I think the work that you and Alexi are doing is so powerful because Mm -hmm. this remembrance of how powerful we are as women is so important Mm -hmm. and we've only seen the feminine as weak and submissive because we've been shown a certain version of it. Yeah. It, it probably did feel very weak and submissive mm. to not be able to open a bank account. And the biggest, one thing you said on the Muse call was the biggest and best wish you could have for yourself. The biggest dream mm. you could dream was to find a good man to marry. Yeah. It's like, let that Isn't land. that crazy? Eh? <laughs> yeah. And look at us now. Mm-hmm. We are sitting here podcasting having our own businesses, like you said, move to a different continent. We are living lives that our ancestors, and it makes me emotional, but our Mm. ancestors could never have even dreamed about for us. Yeah. And I think this is just important because we're doing the work of figuring out, okay, what does it look like to to bring the feminine and masculine together and actually be a powerful woman Mm -hmm. in today's society? Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful that you're doing this work. Mm. And I'm just curious for you because you'd mentioned um you know, moving to a new co- uh, continent, you are single right now, you're actively dating. Mm. And you were saying for some people in society, they could look at you and think, oh, well, she's not on track. Yeah. How is that feeling for you being able to do this work and tap into what you want? Yeah. And just like, co- like everything you just said, yes. Like, oh my gosh, for just, I think especially the more attuned and more self-worth um, that I've built for myself, the more appreciation I can also cultivate for the feminine. Like I'll see a beautiful dancer, a beautiful woman, and it's like, oh, like, yeah, just in awe of the feminine. And I think that's such a big thing too. If Like we have a lot of women that come to this work with like sister wounds and women against women. And I think really the more we come into that too and really support like just the range and the spectrum of womanhood, it's just such a beautiful, beautiful place to get to. Um, and yeah, I mean this, and it's, it it just, I think really empowers me to, to just continue to like, again, the world is changing so much. And again, like we live in a society that still favors ticking a box versus the quality of your life. Like I could be married. I could have children. I could have a house. I could have the white picket fence. I could have all the things that society tells me makes me a good woman. 
and be miserable. And we see that time and time again, right? Because that's, there's a lot of that pressure and you have to be very resilient and committed to like still choose your alignment in this world that says, this is how it should look, you know? And there's definitely moments where I feel like, oh man, 37 and single and everyone's married and you know, I should be in a different stage. And I have to remind myself of those things. Like you could have all those things, but like, would that be what's true for you? And I think really like that's a, such a big piece of, I guess, essentially like, you know, with Lex and I, she's married with kids and, and more stable and I'm the, the dating world <laughs> gallivanting around the world one. And we both bring our magic of what that really shows for like, what's true for you. Um, and I think that's just a big piece of my mission with this work is like, what would it look like to be the muse of your life? Like, what is really true for you? Like, what makes your life great? Like, the, the, the texture of my life and my availability for how present and attuned I feel in my life every day. Like, you could not swap that out for anything. Like, you could not tell me I would be more happy if I, like, I would never swap that for this. And I think it's like, again, like you said, our ancestors never had that choice and never was on the cards. And so the more of us that are really living in attunement to ourselves, that's how we shift what society looks like. Like, oh, these people that are doing that. Oh, I didn't know I could do that. Oh, okay, great. Like, I never said that I was going to move to a, like I've lived in seven countries. <laughs> I never was like, oh, I'm going to move to another place. But being, being comfortable with creating that safety for myself, being attuned to life, seeing that life was like making that decision pretty clear for me it was like okay so I trust trust that you know um and so that's a big piece of yeah I think what I bring to the work too it's just like what would it look like to choose you you know I love it I, I feel like all of this conversation has just come back to having the choice yeah and knowing that you have the choice to mm -hmm. actually build something that feel like you said you could have it all yeah. on paper but yeah. be miserable yeah and actually, what are you choosing? How do you want to show up? How do you want to spend your day? How do you want to operate? Mm -hmm. It comes back to the choice, not what society tells you. And I, I know there's a lot of women listening because I see it all the time in my DMs who think they're behind, whether it's because of relationships, yeah. whether it's because of kids, whether it's because of um, they've been in corporate all their lives and they're just mm -hmm. quote unquote starting their businesses now. Yeah. And I, all, I, I had such a realization for myself when I was wrestling with, wanting to just slow down and step back mm -hmm. once I had Noemi and had this big story that if I slow down I'll be behind yeah and I had that I like really sat with that and I was like what the fuck are you talking about behind of what where, where are you Who? trying to go yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> you racing to death like yeah, yeah. but it, I had to sit with myself mm -hmm. to have that moment to realize yeah. there is no finish line that this is it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's no test run this is it yeah yeah. And so I love, love, love that you shared that. Can you tell everyone where they can find a bit more about Muse? And you did FFT, so hopefully totally. your sales page is now looking yes, so spot on. Literally <laughs> coming on the up and up. So excited about that. Well, and like the nervous system, work. the nervous system work is what allows you to have more choice because you're more resourced to actually have the capacity to choose versus like reacting and feeling like, and again, like that, that behind thing it's similar to the starting over. Like, I don't want to start over. And it's like, that concept is crazy. How could you be starting over? You have all of this experience, all of this self-knowledge, all of these things. Like, because I think that, that that feeling can limit a lot of people too. Like, I don't want to start over. And it's like, you are bringing so much with you. What? You're in the best place you've ever been. You have all of this life experience. And and I think that one's a, that one's a really big one as well. So we have a, um, which also goes into the titration piece. So um, you can find that at awakenthemuse.com forward slash boss babe. That's just essentially a, a, tr a free training around that titration process to really like master the art of receiving, like really being able to receive more in your life and more fullness. Um, and then Muse, um, we're on Instagram, Muse Revealed. Um, and just awakenthemuse.com. And yes, we have a very sexy, amazing funnel coming because we got Natalie's support on that. So we're very excited for that. <laughs> and what about your Instagram? What's your Instagram? Yeah, so my Instagram, I recently rebranded from my conscious boss. It felt like such a moment, you know, when you like rebrand from this old version of you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just, I am Emily Gallagher. I love it. I'm yeah. in Muse. I freaking love it. I mm. have to say what you've both created is phenomenal. Oh, it really, you. really is. Mm. And I do truly believe it's not just life-changing work but society-changing work 
Mm. It's big. Mm, thank you for that. And I, I, there's something about this work that feels like it's there. It's probably the most potent thing I think for either of us. Like there's an energy about it, and I think it's because it's just something that like women are wanting. The life is asking for it. Like there's energy in it that's like it's so not us creating it. It's just like oh my gosh, it feels so alive. Um, and absolutely, I think it's like the the generational piece. We've had some feedback around that, and it's just yeah. Thank you for that feedback and. Um, yeah, it's, it's really an honor. Like it's an honor to be in this work and with the women that come into it, it's, it's beautiful. And, and yeah, so excited that you got a taste of it and that like you're being such a beautiful example of like a high performing, high achieving woman that still wants an amazing life. Like it's not, I think it's big to like, it's not, you can't still achieve and can't still create that, but like, how do you do it in a way that still feels really beautiful and you have such a great influence. And I love that you're, you know, really being an example of that for so many women too so thank you shout out to you on that (laughs) thank you and one thing I noticed because I always have my funnel hat on even when I'm going through programs I'm always like who's their demographic because I'm always I'm like I'm like what's the hook what's the webinar what's the funnel and what I've really noticed about the demographic of muse and I'm just calling this out just in case anyone self-identifies as this but um it's really those high performing women Mm. often the breadwinners yeah who have just done life a certain way mm-hmm. up until they are not able to continue doing it that yeah. way anymore. And I'm yeah. just listening to the calls, you know, a lot of women in that burnout phase, a lot of mm-hmm. women uh, who are the breadwinners and feel like they can't soften for that reason because they are holding yeah. so much responsibility. Yeah. And so it's just been really interesting to see that. And I'm yeah. excited to see how your funnel comes together too. Thank you. I'm excited. I'm so it. excited to have your support and such an honor to like have you in the space and, and, you know, it's always really beautiful when your friends know your work and things mm. like that too. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, we sort of joke as like, it's how to woman well, like, yes. you know, it's like, it's not, <laughs> it's like the school of how to woman well. Cause it's like, we, you know, again, we resist from just like the feminine like aspect. It's just that that's often a big piece that it's like that more atrophied muscle that women are coming to, to it on. But it's like, how do we, how do we move through the world as a modern woman in a way that feels so good to us not the script not the program but like to you inherently and really figuring out what that is and then having the capacity to like move forward and create from that place um yeah so it's such a gift i love it well thanks for being here thanks for having me Woo woo! 